Let's begin with the cases. We've simplified the unit into two cases, one for the tube and base, and another for the accessories. The handle on these cases has been beefed up to take even more wear and tear. To begin setting up your unit, you will start with the accessory case. Find the yellow base plate with wheels inside and place it on the ground. Now you are going to want to retrieve your tube and base case. From inside this case, grab the attached tube and base and place them into the plate on the ground. You will see in the next portion of this video that on the base plate there is a ratchet that must be unlocked to receive the base and tubes. Now that the base has been inserted into the base plate, you will need to lock it into place. Find the ratchet at the bottom and turn it until it becomes tight. You can pop it out to the side to readjust its position, lock it back into place, and turn to secure the ratchet. Now we will begin the leg setup. On arrival, you will find that your high pod legs are locked into the closed position with the leg locking pin. You will need to remove this pin and move it and the leg to the exterior hole, locking the pin through the leg itself and the bracket. You will not lock the pin either behind the leg or in front of the leg, as this does nothing to secure it before elevation. You will see that these are examples of how not to lock the leg. Again, make sure to lock the leg with the leg pin on the exterior hole so that the pin is going through the leg and the bracket itself. This locks the leg into position. At this point in the setup, you can extend the high pod legs to their full length. Lock them loosely as you will most likely need to adjust them in the next step. Check the bubble on the top of the high pod base to ensure that your legs are set evenly. Adjust the legs to make them level and check the bubble again. At this point in the setup, your unit should look like this, legs extended and locked into place. Shake the silver ring at the top of the base to confirm that your legs are rock solid. Any movement, readjust and try again. Once the leg is confirmed to be stable and the primary leg lock has been tightened, you can adjust the second leg lock into place. This is a redundant safety lock in case the primary lock ever gives way or slips. Both leg locks must always be used on each leg. Never extend a high pod tubing system until both leg locks are in place. You can see another view here of what these leg locks look like in their proper positions. Now, on the top of the base, just above the silver ring, you will find another ratchet. It's the same style as the one on the base plate. When it's open, you will be able to swing the tubes left and right. If you close the ratchet like this, it will grab the tubes inside of the base. This holds the tubes in the base while you're extending the tubing. Now we will begin to connect the HiPod cable bundle to the unit. Take the bundle and look for a yellow T-bar across one end. This will notate that it is the top end of the cable. From the top of the tower, you will find a carabiner dangling down from a silver clip. This acts as your cable strain relief. Put the cable through this clip coming down from the top so that the yellow T-bar is above the clip. It'll hang on that side of the clip, acting as a strain relief for the cable. You will find a piece of Velcro around the T-bar so that you can even more securely attach it to the strain relief. Your camera motor will arrive screwed into a mounting pedestal. These are the two screws involved just in case you ever need to detach it from this pedestal. Different people have various preferences for motor control. Some want the literal up to be the direction up and down to be the direction down, while others like the directional controls to be inverted. Depending on how you mount the camera, either forwards or backwards, your motor controls via the remote will be appropriate for you. Under the motor you'll find the black mounting pedestal. Insert this to the top of the high pod tubes and turn the ratchet until tightly secure. Note that this is a ratchet and you can turn it to a point, pop it out, reposition and continue tightening until secure. Find your LCD bracket and attach it to the tubes like this. Screw the silver screw into the black collar until it attaches firmly. Notice the ratchet on the LCD bracket. If you unlock this ratchet, you will be able to adjust the angle at which the LCD sits on the bracket itself. Now it's time to attach the LCD to the unit. 
On the back of the LCD, you will see a groove which will fit into the tip on the LCD mounting bracket. Just slide this into place, and then on the back of the LCD, from the tip, you'll see a round twist screw which will secure the position of the monitor so that it won't move while in use. You can see a closer view of that motion here. A very important consideration. When changing the angle of the LCD, unlock the ratchet on the bracket at this pivot point. Adjust the LCD to preference and lock again. Don't simply try to push the LCD as you'll harm the track on the back. If you purchased a unit before 2017, you have a battery for your LCD that accepts two pins on a battery plate on the back of the LCD. Line up the battery on the plate in the grooves to accept the pins. Note that the ratchet on the back of the LCD bracket must be facing away from the screen to allow space to mount the battery. This is the new LCD for 2017 going forward. It uses a different battery system. Note there's a piece of Velcro on the back and there is another one on the battery itself. You will be using two ports on the back, HDMI 1 and the DC port, both marked with red arrows here. This is the battery for the LCD. The exact model may change over time, but setup will remain the same. Take the battery and use the Velcro to attach it to the back of the LCD and connect the USB port to the DC port with this adapter. This sends power from the power pack into the LCD itself. Once you have the battery connected, click the round button and it will start to glow blue. On the front of the LCD, the red button will light up, indicating power is connected. Turn on the unit by clicking the power button and then toggle through the input settings until you find your video input source. To charge the battery for the LCD, there is a short micro USB to standard USB cable that you will plug into the wall adapter. Plug it into the wall and you'll see the battery glow blue. Now from your cable bundle, locate the HDMI cable and plug in. Push it in the whole way. You can either mount your camera forward or backward to invert the controls. This is completely up to preference. Now going out standard with all towers is the cable strain relief plate. You can see it here. This plate will lock your cables under the camera so that they can't pull on the delicate ports where they connect. You can see you thread one cable in one of these grooves and the other in the other groove. And they will need to be facing in opposite directions so the connecting ports come out on opposite sides of the camera where the ports are available. When the cables are in place, attach your camera on top like this. And then underneath, you will screw into the camera to connect tightly using either a screwdriver or even a coin will work. With cables threaded under the camera using the strain relief plate, it will look like this. Now to mount to the top of the motor, find the screw that's inside of the sliding groove and just note the smaller metal piece will be irrelevant. Locate the smaller hole above the golden screw and then use that to attach to the screw coming out of the motor. Make sure to use this strain relief plate with your assembly. If you do not, it will affect the terms of your electronics warranty. Now at the top of your cable bundle, cable bundle, locate the small and plug it into the port on the camera. Let's talk about camera setup. There are two big differences between earlier cameras and current cameras. For the earlier CX220s and the cameras in that line, you'll have a battery that looks like this which attaches to the back. Newer cameras that started shipping in August of 2016 no longer have a battery slot in the back of the camera. They have a fixed shell now, and you have to plug into an external battery via the USB cord in the hand strap. You can see an image of the battery we're shipping now, although we have also shipped a white one previously. Either connect in the same way. You can connect the battery to the top of the HiPod tubes via one of the brass screws as pictured here. Also take note, the cable and remote setups will vary whether you have a camera with a battery in the back physically connected to the camera or whether you're using this external battery pack connected by USB. We will flip back and forth between the two cable and camera setups. One final note about the current USB power pack style battery, you will need to run an extension cable which is a USB female on one end that plugs into the camera's USB cable in the handle strap to the standard USB port that is in the power pack battery. This is how you run power from the battery to the camera. You will need to click the button that is on the side of the battery so that it turns on and you will see the blue lights flash. Otherwise, the battery will lay dormant and not power the camera. This is important so that you don't accidentally draw power from the small internal battery in the camera. When plugging into the larger power pack, 
plug the USB cord into the port that says 2.4A. Otherwise, if you plug into the smaller of the voltage out ports, it will give you an error message on the camera saying the accessory cannot be used. Now, let's go back to the cameras that have a battery physically plugged into the back of them. A lot of people have been confused about how to charge those batteries. What you do is you leave the battery in the back of the camera and plug in that camera to a USB power source. This can either be a computer or a wall adapter with a USB. This is how you charge that battery. To charge the USB power pack style battery, there is a micro USB power cable similar to the one for the LCD included in the kit. And you plug that into either the wall adapter or to a USB port that is on a computer to charge. You'll see the blue lights light up until four of them are fully lit to indicate 100% charge. Now let's talk camera remotes. You'll have one of the following, the Sony Silver Remote, the Vivitar, or the Verizoom. These three remotes set up the same way. A new remote, the Black Sony, has also started going out and that has a different setup. We'll come back to that later. Different remotes have gone out over the years with different cameras. You can see this remote, the Silver Sony, has been shipping from 2010 until about mid-2015. To mount this to the handle, open up the plastic clip in the back and attach it to the plate coming out of the handle. The Vivitar remote shipped from 2014 through 2015. It has a clip on the back that if you open will attach to the same plate coming out of the handle. The Verizoom remote was introduced in 2015. It has two screws in the back which hold a metal plate into position across the back of the remote. Open up those screws enough to create a gap and then slide the remote onto the same plate on the handle. Tighten the screws to hold the remote in place. Find the Sony multi-port cable, which looks like this, and plug it into the camera. Then, at the back of this cable, you will insert a D cable, which is now a D pigtail. It looks like this. There's a stereo jack on the opposite end and a D-shaped head that plugs into the female D-shaped port on the multi-cable. It's highly likely that instead of the D pigtail, you have this version with the full RCA cables as well. Disregard the red, yellow, and white cable and focus on the black cable with the stereo plug. This is the only one that is used. Your setup should look like this at this point. Now from your cable bundle, find the long skinny black cable with a silver female tip at the end of it. This will be connected to the stereo jack that was on the end of the D pigtail. At the bottom of the tower, for the Silver Sony, Vivitar, and Verizoom remotes, you will have a 3-pin connector. Plug that into your long skinny length cable. That finishes the remote setup for cameras with a battery physically in the back of them. Now, for those of you using the black Sony remote, this is your setup. Go into your case and find this black plastic cradle. This is what you're going to slide the remote into. You see it has a clip in the back. This is going to attach to that plate that juts out of the handle. Slide the remote in, turn that clip sideways, and then attach it to the handle itself. You can see a close-up of that connection here. To connect the remote to the camera, the process is much simpler. There's only one cable. You can see it here. The black end goes into the camera and the white end goes into the remote. Do not reverse this, as if you do, it's not gonna work. And then the robot control. This cable is slightly thicker and looks like this. Typically, you can leave these two remotes dangling from the LCD bracket. There is a speed setting on the robot controller that you're gonna wanna push all the way up. To set up text on screen to see your battery and record status, follow these steps. From the default screen, hit the menu button and then select camera mic in the top middle. It'll bounce you into a scroll window and then look for scene selection. Your display will change to look like this. Then on the far right, you'll see an arrow. On the bottom, go ahead and click on that and leave your screen here. You will see standby, which turns into record and battery life. Each time you turn the camera on, you will need to set this up. Now to program your camera so it won't auto turn off after a few minutes, go to setup, and then scroll down until you see something that either says power save or eco mode and then go ahead click into that and turn power save or eco mode off it varies based on which model you have also if you see an option that says demo mode you would want to go into that and turn that off as well continuing with camera settings this is something you're going to need to do at first time setup only. New cameras shipping in 2017 have an automatic dual video record setting activated in the camera. What this does is to record two files of the same clip in two different formats. What that does effectively is to take up twice as much memory in your SD card as it needs to. So to turn this off, this is what you need to do. Go to menu and then after that point, click on the top right icon that says image quality slash size. 
Then scroll down to where you find dual video record option and make sure that option is turned off. That will save you this extra file space and allow you to record longer at a time. One final note for those of you who are using the USB power pack style camera battery, to confirm the correct battery is powering your camera, once you have text on screen set up as explained earlier in this manual, look at your screen and if in the top right hand corner you see a battery icon, either dead or partly charged or anything at all that shows a battery, that means you're drawing power from the small internal battery in the camera. You need to click the external power pack battery on the side once connected for it to take over as the main battery for the camera. Otherwise, if you use the internal battery, that camera will die within 30 to 45 minutes. Once you have clicked the external battery and it is turned on, the battery icon on the LCD will disappear. This is what you want and it confirms the larger battery is active as the power source for the camera. Now, if you're going to mount the rain gear to this unit, these are the steps involved. There's a little mounting pedestal that you will use to facilitate sandwiching the camera into the rain gear as such. When you're done, the rain gear covering looks like this. We've made it a lot larger to cover the motor underneath. Now, when installing the camera to the rain gear, these are the steps. Sandwich the camera to the rain gear plate with this little screw. It's an additional insert you'll find in your case. Sandwich the camera into the rain gear and then screw that pedestal onto the robotic motor directly. Each stage of tubing has a cam lock that secures the tube in place. To elevate your unit, unlock the cam lock, push the tube into the air to your desired height, and lock the cam lock again. This will squeeze the poles together so that they cannot move. You will see a white line on the end of each tube recommending where the placement of the tube should be locked. There are safety pins for the bottom stages of the HiPod tubes. For the X23, there is a single pin for the fourth stage, whereas for the 31, there are three for the fourth, fifth, and sixth stages. Find the hole at the bottom of each HiPod stage, take the pin, and push the pin through the hole. This will prevent the tube from slipping if a cam lock for some reason fails. On each stage of the HiPod tubes, there is a strip of Velcro to keep the cables out of the way. Take the Velcro strip, open it, place the cable inside, and close it again. Beyond keeping the cables neat, it helps to act as a strain relief throughout the unit.